All right, I knew there was one more good question out there that I that I had missed. And then we're gonna go inside because it's getting a little cold out. The sun went behind a cloud. Um, this is a really interesting one and it gets at a bigger issue. Could Gatsby and Daisy have been lived, could Gatsby and Daisy have lived happily ever after? It's a good question, Lily. Uh, the answer is no, uh, in my view anyway. This book could not, this book could not have ended any other way. Uh, I cannot imagine Daisy leaving Tom and going with Gatsby and they have a kid and get a minivan and she becomes a soccer mom and it's just not headed in that direction. It would not support the theme of the book. Um, the theme of the book is that America is a programmed place. If you're born rich like Tom and Daisy and Jordan, you're good to go. You can do whatever you want. Um, and you're always going to intermarry, interbreed, which of course isn't healthy. Um, and you cannot be like Gatsby's dream is, is, is bad and it's not going to happen. So there's no other way this book could have ended. Um, and let's face it, folks, let's face it, folks. And now I'm going to, oh, let me get the book here. This reminds me of something. Daisy was never going to live up to Gadsby's dreams. Think about it. If there was someone you fell in love with, then you didn't see them anymore. And all you did was dream about them for five years. You would have them so hyped up in your head. The chances of that person ever living up to what you came up with, what you've been thinking about, is crazy. Um, that person would have no chance at all. And I'm looking for it here. So, all right, so this is uh, the end of chapter five. All right, so been a little scattered with our chronology. First three chapters, quickly. There's a party in each chapter. First party, first chapter, first party. Nick goes over to Daisy and Tom's. Um, the mistress calls, it's happened to all of us. The mistress calls during dinner. Uh, and Daisy's upset, an argument ensues. The party ends in a very uncomfortable way. Party number two, chapter number two. It's a Daisy, it's a Tom and Myrtle's, Tom and Myrtle's love nest. That ends with Tom breaking Myrtle's nose and blood on the floor. Again, the hosts, the party winds up in a mess. Chapter three, there's another party at Gadsby's. I think you were there, Shane. The party at Gadsby's. It's great. When the people are leaving, there's that ridiculous car accident with owl eyes in the car and he gets out and he says he wasn't trying to drive and the crowd is upset and he's, it turns out he wasn't driving. It's a drunk driving thing and the driver gets out and he wants to back it out. He's all drunk. Um, it's a mess. All three chapters so far all have a party, all in a, in a mess. The difference, the party at Gatsby's the mess at the end does not involve Gadsby. Gadsby on his, is on his porch saying goodbye, waving a farewell to all these people who he has no interest in and he probably doesn't even really like. So those are the first three chapters. The fourth chapter is uh, where uh, Nick and Nick finds out that Gadsby wants him to uh, reunite him and Daisy and Nick does so. Uh, they go to Nick's house. It's very uncomfortable. Uh, Gadsby has been waiting for five years to reunite with Daisy, okay? Five years to reunite with her. And this is his line. We've met before. Really, five years, Gadsby? And this is what you have for when you meet the woman of your dreams again? We've met before, muttered Gadsby. And then he famously knocks the clock off and he catches the clock. The clock is broken. Gadsby's holding frozen time. The symbolism there, by the way, I once wrote a 20 page paper about the use of time in the great Gadsby. And if you read the preface, if you have this version, it goes into that a little bit. If you want to read my 20 page paper, you really need to find something more to do with your life. So he's holding this broken clock. Um, frozen time. Now in the most recent movie version with Leonardo DiCaprio and Tobey Maguire, the clock is ticking. Wrong. I hate that. 
the movie's not that great anyway, but the clock is ticking. The clock's broken. All right, so anyway, so they it's very uncomfortable. Finally, uh, Gadsby gets Daisy over to his house so he can she can see how rich he is, and she can say, oh, now that you're rich, I'll go with you. So they're walking around, they're walking around, and, and Gadsby's beside himself. Nick is finally going to leave them alone so they can start their affair. As I went over to say goodbye, I saw the expression of bewilderment had come back into Gadsby's face, as though a faint doubt had occurred to him as to the quality of his present happiness. Almost five years. There must have been moments, even that afternoon, when Daisy tumbled short of his dreams. Not through her own fault, but through the colossal vitality of his illusion. Daisy falls short of Gadsby's dreams, not for her own fault, because of the colossal vitality of his illusion. All right, what's that mean? He's overhyped her. So imagine this, and I don't recommend this. You're going to set up your friends, two friends who don't know each other. You're setting them up on a date. And you say, oh, he's the best guy ever. He's amazing. Everything he says is funny. And, and oh, she's so cute and great. No, because they're never going to meet that expectation. You overhyped it. You say, yeah, he brushes his teeth most of the time. And, you know, yeah just enough so she'll go out with him. What if someone says, you need to go see this movie. It's the best movie ever. This movie will change your life. No, that person's going to go to the movie and say, it wasn't that good. Here's your lesson. We've talked about this before. No other person is going to give you this lesson. Keep your expectations low in life. Always work hard and you'll always be satisfied. The least happy people in life are people with high expectations in low motivation, always discontent. But if you don't ask for a lot from life, but you work hard and do your best, you'll be the most satisfied, at peace person on earth. Somebody's gotta tell it to you straight out there. Okay, there must have been even moments, even that afternoon when Daisy tumbled short of his dreams not through her own fault because of the colossal vitality of his illusion. It had gone beyond her, beyond everything. He had thrown himself into it with a creative passion, adding to it all the time, decking it out with every bright feather that drifted his way. No amount of fire or freshness can challenge what a man will store up in his ghostly heart. There's no way she was going to live up to his expectation. He'd put her on a pedestal. Don't put people on a pedestal. Why? Because everybody's imperfect. Put somebody on a pedestal, you're setting them up to fall. So Lily, good question. There's no way Gadsby and Daisy, I'm sorry, uh, are ever going to be together and be happy. His expectations are unrealistic. And she's been programmed since birth to be with an old money man like Tom. Sorry. Uh, while we're poking around uh, chapter 5, it's one of my more favorite chapters. Got the clock. Yeah, we already talked about that clock. I think it's in chapter 4. I'm going to try to keep talking here because you know what? Editing these videos is really uh, difficult and time consuming. It's not difficult. It just takes a while. So there, I filled up the spot so I don't have to cut it out. Backing up, this is actually chapter four. This is when Jordan asks Nick the favor on behalf of Gadsby. Hey, will you reunite them? Nick says about Gadsby having the house right across the bay from Daisy. Remember? It was a strange coincidence, I said, but it wasn't a coincidence at all. Why not? Gadsby bought the house that Daisy would just be across the bay. 
than it had not been merely the stars to which he had aspired that June night. Remember when Nick saw Gadsby reaching out for the green light? Then it had not been merely the stars to which he had aspired on that June night. He came alive to me, delivered suddenly from the womb of his purposeless splendor. Delivered suddenly from the womb of his purposeless splendor. Because up to this moment, Nick thinks Gatsby's a nut. He, he, he says he's from San Francisco. He says he's from the Midwest. Nick says where? Gatsby says San Francisco. San Francisco's on the California coast. So he's thinking all, Nick's thinking this guy's a kook. This guy's a crackpot. But when Nick finds out that it is all for Daisy, Gatsby is delivered suddenly from his, the womb of his purposeless splendor and it all makes sense. Now I want to end before I go inside. I've got a few minutes left here on this 15 minute chunk. Uh, Paige came up with a good quotation. Uh, first off, this is Paige. Paige, first off, I enjoyed this book. I believe the number one theme is the fall of the American dream in the 20s. Well, maybe it never existed. Maybe it's all a hoax. Fake news. George Carlin, great comedian and cultural observer. George Carlin once said, the reason they call it the American dream is because you have to be asleep to believe it. I want to share that quote because I love it. And maybe someone else will too. Yeah, that's good. The reason they call it the American dream is because you have to be asleep to believe it. Now, let's stop again here, and I like our theme here of the American Dream. Maybe I'll put that on the essay exam. Um, a few years ago, some economists um, figured out the chances of people in America moving up the economic ladder. If you're born into a family on the lower rung of an economic ladder, what is your chance of moving up? the chances are slim and it's all on a graph and you know what that's called he called it the economist called it the gadsby curve google it google it right now the gadsby curve and it shows how difficult it is to move up the economic ladder in this country um, number one if you're not born with a lot of money uh it, it's hard to to make a lot of money but also the you know you're just not used to it and maybe people have made bad choices in your family so that, um or maybe they just have had bad luck but we get comfortable sometimes with the amount of money we we grow up with and that's kind of what we wind up with but it is difficult to take great leaps up the social and economic ladder but you guys have made a good start you're in college every time you make a choice to work hard on a paper to study for a test you're making a choice to move up the economic ladder. Of course, money doesn't buy you happiness, but it helps. Um, by coming to Columbia Green and not going into great debt at, for a four-year school yet, uh, you've made a good choice. It's gonna help you move up the economic um, ladder. So, yeah, um, and having a lot of stuff we've already established is not, the Amer is not happiness, but having enough is important. And I do believe in America, I do believe that through hard work and being careful and not making stupid spending decisions like the Morrill family in The Rocking Horse Winner and Nettie Merrill, that you can improve your financial situation. I did it. I grew up in a family without a lot of money. A lot of love. I loved my family. It wouldn't change my childhood. But for some reason, I figured out how to live very frugally in life, especially going to Columbia Green um, when I was a student. and. Uh, how to live frugally in that heck why not stuff doesn't matter anyway and i'm very fortunate and i hope i can get through to a few of you about that so yeah you have to be asleep to believe in the american dream but i'm going to tell you have a different american dream dream of being fulfilled dream of avoiding stuff dream of having a house small house dream of not spending money and being in tune with people and nature all right, um, I'm really kind of getting a little chilly out here, so we better head inside.